All right, we have found a composition that kind of features our creature in our landscape where it takes up at least 25% of the composition. And if I needed to, I could always use my move tool and crop in order to zoom in. So for instance, if I decided that my creature looked best at a smaller scale, like maybe because it's a small little creature on the top of this cabbage blossom. Then this composition doesn't really showcase the creature very well. I squint and I can't even see it. So then I might use my guides with the rulers turned on, Command R to turn on the rulers. And I might crop it using the crop tool here to a composition that showcases the creature better. And that meets the, the aspects of the assignment just fine, even though it cuts down on its physical dimensions. Right, so if that's a better placement, and honestly, with as busy as my background is, this might be a better approach. And I can always keep playing with it. It's still a smart object, so I can still scale it, rotate it, without losing any quality as I go. Yeah, that looks like a pretty good placement, I think. So that instead of that. Yeah, it's hard. Indecisive here. Let's see, do I want this? I'll have you guys vote. Do you think this is a better scale and placement to work with? Or this? One vote for number one. All right, good deal. But you can see the options you have. The point is we really wanted to showcase the creature. Okay. Get this guide out of there. Okay, so what are we looking for here? If we go to the assignment, go to our homepage, Go to unit modules. This is going to be unit six, our first proving ground. Remember, we're trying a bunch of different things, trying to start applying these lessons of compositing and putting our creature into an environment where we match the lighting and the angle of the anatomy, but also recognizing what the physical dimensions are and what the pixel dimensions are. If you crop it, it's going to be less than what it was originally for assignment one. And then we're going to make sense of it by giving a little description, a few sentences, like a short paragraph description of how our creature survives in this environment. That helps inform us to how we alter the things for them to match. So here are some past student examples. So if we look at the assignment itself, You'll see that this can be done with very disparate figurative content on different backgrounds, like these animated monsters from Space Jam. But notice how their lighting has to match the environment. Their color temperature has to match the environment. Their cast shadows under their feet have to match the environment. That's what pulls this illusion off. Same thing here. The lighting, the atmosphere the focus, the soft edges, the hard edges, all has to match the environment. So this is what you're going to be graded on. First of all, once you have your finished cropping, you already can do step one, which is to go to image, image size, and say what your physical dimensions are in inches. So mine currently 
is 9.78 inches by 15.69 inches at 350 pixels per inch. And then I have to state, is that good enough for print resolution or is that limited and can only be used as screen resolution? If it's at your desired physical dimensions at over, at, at or over 300 pixels per inch, it is print resolution. If it's below 300 pixels per inch, it is screen resolution. If it's below 72 pixels per inch at the size you want, then it's nothing. <laughs> so hopefully everyone is at least at a decent size at at least 72 pixels per inch because that's the standard minimum for screen resolution. But this one's good enough for print resolution. So I'm good on that. That's step one, making sense of my data. I'm going to accurately identify the resolution in pixels per inch and physical format print size and then identify whether it's good for, for screen resolution or for print resolution. That will give me that full point. Next is placing my PNG creature into the landscape in a way that utilizes a common light direction and accommodates for the angle of my creature's anatomy. So basically making it make sense in this setting. Do I have that yet? No. If I squint, my creature looks kind of dark and just flat lit. Whereas this cabbage blossom, these leaves, this foreground tree all has a pretty bright light hitting the back of it. I have that bright light at the top of my creature, but I don't have it on the back of my creature. So in order to match its angle of anatomy, that I have a little bit closer. Like that foot almost looks like it's touching the leaf. There's a foot here that could be touching a leaf. I need to refine that a little bit. Well, that's not even a foot, that's a shadow. And then this one, I want to make it look physically like it's bending this leaf down. So there's little things I need to do to make its anatomy match. Now I'm going to show you a technique now where we can actually pose the creature. I didn't do this with the morning class. Sometimes it comes up, sometimes it doesn't. But because my silhouette makes clear sense of the anatomy, this is going to work well. The first thing I need to do is make a duplicate of my smart object character. And what I usually do is mark my smart object character with a green color. So I know if I ever need to get back to my smart object, I can. That's my clean sticker. Now I duplicate it, Command J. I turn off the smart layer and then I right click it and I'm going to rasterize it. So it's no longer a smart object. That lets me edit it. And now I might change its color to orange by right clicking next to the eyeball and choosing color. Okay, now I go up to edit and I use this tool called Puppet Warp on my rasterized creature. What it does is it's like the warp tool, except instead of just a nine square grid that you can warp, it gives me a, a polygon grid, like a chicken wire grid. On this grid, I am going to click on the parts of the anatomy where you have a static a static structure of the skeleton like the skull or the cranium attached to a dynamic structure that can move like the spine. So I'm going to click where the spine touches the cranium. I'm going to click where the tail pivots from the tailbone. I'm going to click where the paw is, where all the paws are that I can see. And I'm going to click on like the nose. And now if I move any of these, it will keep what's rigid, rigid, and it will keep what's flexible, flexible, because I've seen the anatomy correctly. And I can angle the head in a different way. And most importantly, I can move the paw up. So it's near the top of that leaf. And I can move this paw back a little bit. And I can move this paw back a little bit. You see how it shifts the hips while I do that. And notice it's changing the tail. I can click the tip of the tail and I can change that direction if I want to pivot it. So if I hit return now, that's my puppet warped creature. If I look at what it was before, it was this. So use puppet warp to angle the anatomy in a way that's more correct. And strangely, it like cut away from it. 
But that's how Puppet Warp's supposed to work. That's why you don't mess with your smart object. So if you notice, that's like a Photoshop processing or a Photo P processing thing. If it cuts away from it, it's no good. So I'm going to duplicate it again. I'm going to rasterize it. And then I'm just going to puppet warp it in a very small way. Edit, puppet warp. I'm just going to lock the head by clicking on a, an anchor point. Lock the hand here, lock the hand here and the elbow, lock the foot here. And I'm just going to move this hand up a little bit and see if that destroys any information. It does. Weird. So I'm not, not sure what's going on with Puppet Warp and Photopea. It's a great tool when it's working. But let's not rely on it in this way. <laughs> okay, so what's the, the poor man's Puppet Warp? Duplicate, rasterize. And what I'm going to do is on this rasterize copy is I'm going to lasso around the, the thing I want to pose and move, like this arm knowing the structure of it. And then I'm just going to do control T and regular warp. <coughs> and then carefully pulling it like rolling dough, I can place that angle of the anatomy to match. You see? So when I turn the layer off below it, it still fits. Now I might get this little seam here from where that merged and that can all be fixed at the end with my smart object like all I have to do is take my smart object and then lasso this part and then duplicate it and then merge these two together so layer merge or command E so all just compositing skills but it's to pose your creature so it can actually be on that surface in a more believable way. So you see now it's kind of bending that leaf. And I can bring that out with that leaf element as well. I can warp that. Same thing with this foot. I'm going to do it again. <coughs> going to lasso just the back leg here. Going to control T. I can even just command J it, duplicate it on its own, and then control T and warp it, tug it, pull it, just like dough. I want to flatten it out and push it back. I can rotate it if I need to, like that. And then I can erase it from the layer behind that I duplicated it from. to get a new foot placement. And then I can merge them together. Command E. So that's angling the anatomy to fit. And then I also have, I'll use auto select layer here with the move tool. I have my landscape aspects. So I can do the same thing to make this work. So this leaf, I can circle it's quite a bit of overlap. Why not? Well, this is something that my creature is balancing on. I can Command J, duplicate it, internal compositing, Control T, and see what it looks like, right? And then Control T and warp it. And I only want to bend it on one side. So that that leaf is bending underneath the weight of this animal's paw. And then I can use my eraser, what we know about compositing, blend in some of these edges if we need to, just to add to that illusion. Where my tablet helps. Pressure sensitive, eraser, soft edged, not too big. <laughs>